when the Americans bought New Orleans, one of the things that was most astonishing to them, there weren't just white people and black slaves. There were these people who were of African or partially African descent who were well-educated, who were sophisticated, who were well-dressed, who were rich, some of them, and who had their own very important social life. That was part of the, the disconnect for Americans coming here, to see black people in positions of success. Yeah, they were very surprised at the openness of the black population, free and slaves. There were free black people throughout the United States, but in most of the other states, particularly in the South, they were not that much better off than slaves, other than they could not be sold away. But basically their life was quite constrained. In New Orleans, because of the French and the Spanish background, the free people of color had almost all the rights of whites. Many of them had the skills which were very critical for developing a new society in the early 19th century. They had many, many professions. There were plantation owners. There were men who dealt in real estate. By the time of the Civil War, about two-fifths of all the land in New Orleans was owned by people who were of mixed race or, or blacks. I believe that these people who became people of means, they were able to interact with the other cultures because of what they had because they were looked upon prior to the Americans coming in. To be of the same stature, probably more of a thing with money than with race. At one point, free people of color had a higher literacy rate than the general population of whites. There was a lot of mixed socializing, whether it was dancing, gambling, going to a cockfight, going to horse races, listening to music, just spending the weekend drinking, whatever, socializing, partying. There was a lot of mixing. There were definitely a means of transferring African civilization. The island of Haiti, or as the Spanish call it, Hispaniola, was among the first places for European contact with the New World. By Columbus's second voyage, he had established an outpost there. Imagine two cultures coming into contact with each other. The difficulty there must have been for both sides to comprehend the other culture. Artistically, the Indians were masters. When you look at the talents of Native Americans throughout the New World, you look at their sensitivity towards the visual arts, toward music. It's part of their legacy from pre-Columbian times. The introduction of diseases and a series of armed conflicts caused the Taino and Arawak Indians to be eradicated in a large part by the middle or third quarter of the 16th century. The experience of the Spaniards and the Indians in Santo Domingo set a theme that was going to be repeated over and over again throughout the Americas. The island is one of the larger ones in the Antilles and was originally occupied entirely by Spain or claimed entirely by Spain. The first Africans began to come into Hispaniola in the first quarter of the 16th century. The explosion really occurs in the first half of the 18th century. The first diocese in the New World was established by the Spaniards and the Catholic Church in Hispaniola. You have to keep in mind that in this period of time, the Catholic Church was sort of the social agent for cultural affairs for the Spanish monarchy. The French, of course, being explorers as well and interested in colonial expansion, also saw the strategic importance of Hispaniola located in this crossroads of the Caribbean, essentially began squatting on the western half of the island, which Spain showed less of an interest in. Ultimately, a formal government was established there late in the 17th century. 1697, Treaty of Zweiswick provided for the acquisition of the western half. The Spanish kept the eastern half, the French got the western half. 
certainly Saint-Domingue had its rural components, but uh, as a colonial place, it was often compared to Paris in the refinements of life that were there. It very quickly developed into the most profitable of all of France's colonies in the 18th century. Urban planning was following the guidelines that had been established in Europe. We even see that here in New Orleans, for example, with Jackson Square, the town plaza. In most cases, the town plaza would be built in the center of the city, surrounded by grid-like streets, except when the town was on a waterway. Then the town plaza would be placed on the waterway. Saint-Domingue had a drainage system, very active public works that had beautiful gardens, beautiful theaters a royal academy, the only one in the French colonies. Both in the literary and in the musical arts, Saint-Domingue and the Caribbean islands were very, very advanced. For example, Haydn's symphonies were commissioned by Chevalier de Saint-Georges, a free person of color, went to France, eventually became a favorite composer of the nobility, and he was the person that commissioned Haydn's Paris symphonies. If you were all white, you had everything in more that you had in Paris, except for a lot of poor whites. The Code Noir Black Code was designed to regulate the conduct of African slaves and free people of color in the French colonies. And as France's colonial empire expanded, the version that was written to apply specifically to Louisiana was published in 1724. The Code Noir on paper provided rights. They had the right to marry, and their marriage could not be divided by their master. So if you sold a slave, you had to sell his wife with him. You could not separate their children until they were teenagers. You had to sell a whole lot. Laws are often made, but for laws to be effective, they have to be obeyed. Enforcement in the far-flung areas of the French Empire were not always strict, and it was not often followed. Slaves, of course, were the very lowest level of the society. They had little or no rights. In fact, you had a very harsh system of slavery, even worse than you had in the British North American colonies because you had no such thing as a growing season. You could grow all year round, so there was always some work for your slaves to do. Slavery was always passed along by the woman. If the woman was a slave and the man was free, the children would be born as slaves. Later on, there were laws that were passed that said that you couldn't free a woman before her 30th birthday. That was to get around some of the code noir. Usually by the 30th birthday, a woman had had her children at that period. So if she were a slave, her children would be slaves. But if she had been freed, then her children would be born as free people. There are many documented instances of liaisons between slave women and white men that produced offspring. Sometimes these offspring were claimed by the father and that potentially provided a pathway to being recognized as a free person with more rights than a slave would have. The free people of color did in fact occupy a legal status. It was sort of a third tier between the upper class whites and the petty blonde and then the slaves. So they did in fact have some recognized rights as a class of people as opposed to just simply being black with some privileges because they were freed. There were free people of color who owned slaves. There were a number of planters who were free people of color who were the children of white planters who inherited the plantation, inherited the slaves and acted much like any other plantation owner. The reality in Saint-Domingue was that you did in fact have these recognized groups, each having some privileges, and they really were not melded together. There was distance between free people of color and the slaves. You had some extremely well-off free people of color in the Caribbean colonies, and they certainly did not want to be identified with slaves. They didn't want to be identified in any case with Africans. They considered themselves to be as free, and since many of them were educated, as good as their white counterparts, and so you did have that separation. The revolution in Haiti in 1791 was a very bloody revolution. 
the French Revolution and the ideas and ideals that it espoused could not philosophically tolerate slavery. In 1793, the French Assembly did banish slavery in all the colonies. The reality was that didn't happen. What separates Toussaint Louverture from other military leaders of that general era was he was a former slave. He wanted France to be great, and he only turned against France when it became clear that there was a movement to reintroduce slavery to the island, which is what really caused the final phases of the revolution. In many respects, he's considered like George Washington, the founder of independence in Haiti. Napoleon sent a huge army to bring French rule back. Napoleon lost. The relation of New Orleans to the island of Hispaniola was very strong during the Spanish period even. We reported to the Spanish authorities in Santo Domingo, the Spanish portion of Hispaniola, that island was sort of the parent colony, whether we were French or Spanish. The trade with the East Coast port cities of the fledgling United States and the colony of Saint Domingue were very strong and resulted in personally based business relationships. And so it would be natural for people who were leaving a bad situation in Saint Domingue to go to places where they had commercial references and other means of a support network. A lot of them, ironically, went to Cuba first and spent a certain amount of time in Cuba, and then they came to Louisiana. There was a large influx of several thousand people after the uprising. Between 1809 and 1810 in New Orleans, the city grew by 10,000 people from Haiti. It's really because of those people that the French language and French culture continued because they really reinforced the French people who were already here. When people came to Louisiana from Saint-Domingue, they brought skills with them in trades like ironwork, brick masonry, or stone cutting to create that sort of infrastructure and physical character that New Orleans has since become known so well for. Voodoo was practiced widely in Saint Domingue. It was not practiced widely in Louisiana until after voodoo priests and priestesses come in. So they are able to preserve all African traditions. These people were so involved with the performing arts, it was part of their heritage. And when they came to Louisiana, they brought that heritage with them. There were blacks who excelled in dancing. There was a black fencing master. We had a very strong musical tradition going back to the beginnings of the city. You just had a very accepting society that appreciated differences. It would just naturally give birth to a figure such as Gottschalk or the jazz, where you weren't penalized for being different. If you look at the French Opera House, you were having marimba bands from Guatemala, Mexican brass bands, German brass bands, opera productions by German organizations. There was a whole music society dedicated to Schubert, the development of opera in New Orleans that was so closely linked to the Saint-Domingue refugees was enormously important for the development of opera in the United States. The children of Saint-Domingue emigres, these poets, banded together in the early 1840s to publish a collected work entitled Les Sanelles, uh, The Holly Berries. This work of some 300 poems by 17 different poets, virtually all of whom traced their family origins to Saint-Domingue, and became a high water mark of this transferred culture. It was a very well-knit community. Everybody knew everybody, and they were proud of themselves. They did not feel at all that they were second-rate in terms of bravery or beauty or intelligence or anything else. Free blacks and slaves added a lot to the culture of the city. Ironically enough, it was the defeat in Saint-Domingue that basically caused Napoleon to change his idea about retaining Louisiana. 
Saint-Domingue is the richest colony in the center of the North American French Empire, and Louisiana was supposed to be the breadbasket. Napoleon had no intention of selling Louisiana before he realized that he could not regain control of Saint-Domingue. Louisiana was going to supply food, going to supply goods, so the solution would be simply to sell it. I think everyone in Louisiana was concerned they'd lose any and everything they have. Imagine, you had land that had been given to you by French and Spanish governments, then all of a sudden you find out you're an American. Now you've been turned over to these people who are always viewed with suspicion. Americans coming in did not see that these people of color should have the same rights. You know, they were of a lower class. Whites got the right to vote under the Americans. Blacks did not get the right to vote. There were certain privileges that were accorded to whites that were not at the same time given to free blacks. They protested against it, but again, they were not given it because if you were not white, you were black. It didn't matter whether you were free, you still were considered to be of an inferior status. One of the justifications for maintaining slavery was that slaves were members of an inferior race. How do you explain that if you have a society which is controlled by blacks that's thriving? So as the Civil War approached, there were different things added to control some of these things that were sometimes quite repressive. Before the Americans changed it, you had the right to acquire freedom by purchase. That became much more difficult after the American takeover. And of course, between 1830 and 1860, it became almost impossible. At this particular period in time, when the laws were gradually tightening up and more restrictions were being placed upon mobility, Free blacks would no longer come into Louisiana if they had not been here already. And you see a large exodus of free blacks out of the state after 1845. Recurring over and over again is the notion of exile, and within that exile, a kind of death. A remarkable number of poems actually discuss suicide. After the Civil War, the slaves were liberated, but at the same time, the Creoles of color suffered tremendously. They weren't really accepted by white society, and they weren't really accepted by the blacks, and they spoke French. What they got were Jim Crow laws. They could not be educated in English because they couldn't be accepted in English-speaking schools. So many of them would complete their education in France. They studied Voltaire, they studied the French Revolution, they studied ideas of the rights of man. And when that generation came back, their eyes were really opened to the injustices that were taking place all around them in Louisiana. Creoles of color were the ones who really led the fight in Plessy versus Ferguson. The thrust of the Plessy case was that in 1883, the United States Supreme Court had ruled that state-imposed segregation was unconstitutional, but private discrimination was okay. If private hotel operators, people who operate steamboats, people who operate restaurants, the Constitution required equality. It did not necessarily mean saying this, that if in fact you could have equal facilities and they were separate, as long as they were equal then, it did not in fact violate the Constitution. For a long, long time, the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of these people understood very clearly the role that their ancestors had played in fighting to prevent segregation from taking place. Dutch Muriel's ancestors, many of them were members of that old free black community before the Civil War, pushing for an end to any distinctions based upon race or color in society. The NAACP would enjoy a lot of support from the descendants of the old free black community. It's come up many times since the storm about the possible loss of the Creole culture. People are coming back because what they left, those of us who've been here for generations, my family's been here for over 200 years, you can't find any place else. But they didn't find that in Houston. They didn't find it in Austin or in San Antonio or LA or wherever they went. Louis Armstrong, discrimination ran him away. He would never come back, but he always expressed his sense of loss, what he had left. In some ways, it is history playing itself over and over again. There are people who have left, but most people, when they want to go home, they want to go home. Our society is filled with stories about a return to home. The Wizard of Oz, which is nothing more than a story of going home and eventual success. <laughs>
that's part of our society. That's part of American culture, this notion of going home. And I think that that will prevail in the long run.